Good morning once again, and welcome to another week of worship and hearing God's word. Now this morning, I want to continue with our theme. You know, our theme for this season is the Church of the Kingdom. These few weeks we have been doing, uh, 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 we have been sharing the word on the Church of the Kingdom. Uh, I spoke about the, the, the first series was, the first part was the Church of the Kingdom, a strong church. And then we saw last week, the Church of the Kingdom having a strong conversion, a strong conversion. And this week, we want to look at the Church of the Kingdom, and we want to, to focus on a strong and true minister, a strong and a true minister. Now, let's get into the word. Please turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. Now, verse 1 says, for yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we have suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness or, of or in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preach unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblamely we behaved ourselves among you that believe, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doeth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who had called you unto his kingdom, and glory. Hallelujah. Now, remember, if you're following our series, you will understand, the church at Thessalonica was under heavy persecution. The Jewish religionists had risen up against Paul. They have risen up against, they had risen up against the church, and they were set on destroying both Paul and the church. They enlisted all the Gentile citizens they could to join the attack. They got all the other unbelievers there to join them in the attack against Paul, to join them against the, in the attack against the church. The, the Jewish religionists convinced the people that the preaching of Christ would destroy their freedom. It will affect their jobs. It will affect their businesses. And the persecution became so violent that Paul was forced to flee for his life. 
However, Paul's absence did not stop the persecution. The attacks against the church and its believers continued. One form which the persecution took was to destroy the reputation of Paul. Accusations after accusations were leveled against Paul. Rumor after rumor was spread about Paul. I don't know whether you can see the similarities with, with the ministers of God today. <clears throat> so Paul's purpose in writing this passage was to strengthen, was to build up the believers in Christ. To do so, he had to answer and he had to correct the charges against him. Paul knew how easily people are influenced by charges and rumors. How easily people become agitated. He wanted no question. He wanted no misunderstanding about him and about the ministry of Christ. Remember, Paul was a minister of Christ, a true minister, and the gospel of Christ was true. This meant that their faith was valid. They were truly saved. They were truly made acceptable to God by the death of Christ, and they were going to live eternally in God's kingdom and glory. The point is this. This passage gives us the picture of a strong minister. The kind of minister, the kind of servant of Christ that every believer should be. I say every believer. That means it's not only the licensed minister. It is also the church leadership. It is also every single believer of Jesus Christ because you are a leader wherever God has placed you. Every believer should be the kind of minister Paul was. Let me go on. You know, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm getting into a bit in depth today because many a times, especially in this season, a lot of people come and ask how we know whether that minister is a true minister of the gospel. How do I know whether this word is correct? How do I know that? Well, today I'm going to give you the keys to knowing. So you do not have to go to another 10 ministers. And if you're a minister yourself, this is to encourage you, is to edify you, to carry on that journey, to carry on that walk. Let's look at verse 1 again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1. It says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. The first point I want to make is this. The strong and true minister has a full and fruitful ministry, not a vain ministry. What does the word vain there mean? The word vain means empty, ineffective, and fruitless. Paul reminds the believers that his ministry among them was not an empty and fruitless ministry. People had been ministered to. Some had even accepted Christ. Some experienced a genuine conversion. They were now living for Christ, living for him through the most difficult of times, even persecution. Therefore, the charge that his ministry was empty, the charge that his ministry was fruitless, was false. God had his hands upon Paul, and God was blessing the ministry of Paul. So the strong and true minister has a full and fruitful ministry, not a vain ministry. Let's go on. Verse 2 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. The second point is this. The strong minister preaches boldly even when there is opposition. Right before Paul had launched his missions, his missions into Thessalonica, he had been shamefully mistreated, imprisoned by some businessmen in Philippi. And he was forced by the city officials to leave the city. However, this did not discourage Paul. He did not give up the ministry because he had been persecuted. He moved on to another city, Thessalonica. But I want you to note this morning what he faced in Thessalonica. He faced persecution. He faced the same mistreatment. He faced the same attacks. But did this discourage him? Did this cause him to give up the ministry? No. He continued to boldly preach the gospel despite the opposition, despite the conflict. The point is this. Bold preaching is proof of a true minister. Bold preaching is proof of a strong minister. A true and strong minister knows that God has called him and he knows why God has called him. And why does God call ministers? God calls ministers to preach the gospel. Amen. Therefore, the minister boldly preaches regardless of the circumstances. Amen. Hallelujah. He boldly preaches of the, or he, his bold preaching of the gospel is one of the strongest answers to his critics. Over the years, we have learned this. We have been criticized and criticized and criticized. It doesn't matter. The more the criticism, the bolder we preach. Amen. I want you to note what bold preaching means. Bold preaching means to preach the gospel of God. Not to lambast one's critics. The pulpit is not the place to deal with critics. The pulpit is the place for preaching the gospel of God. The place where the unsearchable riches of Christ are to be proclaimed. And this is exactly what Paul did, despite the critics of the gospel who opposed him. I want us to remember this. Let me give you a scripture reference. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7, where Jesus says, and as he go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as he go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is is at hand. Preach the gospel. Verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in, nor in quail. The strong and true minister, <clears throat> sorry, nor in guile. Let me read that again, verse 3. For our exhortation was not in deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. The strong and true minister preaches a pure gospel. He lives a clean life and he does not deceive people. Now there are three things said here in the small verse, in the short verse, three things said. Firstly, Paul says, the strong minister preaches a pure gospel. The strong minister preaches a, a pure gospel. The word deceit means error. Paul did not add or take away from the word of God. You know, he, he did not tiptoe around or bypass controversial subjects because of opposition. He did not attempt to tickle the ears of people by preaching only the subjects that they liked. 
He did not neglect the whole counsel of God's word. He did not concentrate on pleasing subjects in order to win the approval of people. He did not neglect the subjects of sin and judgment. He did not preach in order to secure personal acceptance and support. He did not preach to gain a personal following. He did not preach to secure his livelihood, nor to strengthen his position as pastor. He did not preach his own ideas, nor the novel ideas of others. He did not follow the latest theological fashion in order to appear up to date and well read. Paul preached the pure gospel, the pure word of God, the message of Jesus Christ, not his creation. We preach the message of Jesus Christ, not the creation of Jesus Christ. It was the act of God, the glorious gospel of salvation, which God had sent to men through his son. That's what Paul was preaching. Paul was not the creator of the message. God was the creator. Amen. Paul was only the messenger of God. Right. A mere man whom God had employed to proclaim his message. Right. Paul was only the ambassador of God. He was a mere servant chosen to deliver the king's message to the world of men. The point is very clear. Paul had no right to change the message. He had absolutely nothing to do with formulating the gospel of Christ. Therefore, he preached the gospel exactly as God had given it. He preached the pure gospel. He preached the pure word of God. And he did it without deviating one point from it. His exhortation was not of error. The second point on verse 3 is this. A strong minister lives a pure and clean life. The word uncleanness means or it has to do with moral uncleanness. Moral uncleanness and impurity. Can you imagine Apostle Paul was being charged with immorality? It, is, it, is, it might be startling to think that Paul was accused of immorality. However, such an accusation was not to be unexpected because of the immoral society of the day. A society so immoral that it had permitted some of the very religions of the day. Paul clearly says that he was not guilty. He had not used the ministry. He had not used his position in the ministry to attract women. He had not lived in uncleanness. What I'm trying to say is this. There's two lessons to be learned here. As followers of Jesus Christ, as servants of the Most High God, there are two lessons that we have to learn here. Firstly is this. Some believers, ministers, and laymen alike have rumors spread about them. Rumors, of course, damage. Rumors hurt. Rumors often destroy the testimony and the ministry of people. And the most tragic of all, rumors always affect the name of Christ. Rumors turn some people away from the gospel and from any chance of ever being reached for Christ. So the persons who begin and spread rumors that destroy people shall face the wrath of God regardless of their profession to know God. The second lesson is this. Some believers, ministers and laymen alike, fall and commit immorality. This, of course, steers wild imaginations in those who are most hurt by the fall of the believer. 
wild imaginations of immoral behavior heaped upon immoral behavior. The hurt person shares his or her hurt with their friends. And from this, rumors begin. And before long, rumor built upon rumor. Unfortunately, this goes on until about all that is known is rumor what that, and what has been imagined. As the followers, as the followers and ministers of Christ, we must always remember this. If the fallen person is a genuine believer, a true follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, one or two things will happen. One of the two things will happen. Firstly, the fallen believer will repent and confess his sin to God and God will forgive him. God will also begin to use him again, sometimes more effectively than ever before. And sometimes we ask why, it's simply because God is a God of restoration. If God is not a God of restoration, few, if any, of us would ever be serving him. This is a fact that we desperately need to learn. Secondly, God will take the fallen believer on home to be with him. Some genuine believers do slip into sin and enslavement a point beyond which they are willing to return to Christ. Now, I want you to note this. Only God knows when a believer is unwilling to repent and when he has reached that point where he will never repent. At that point, the believer is never again to be a witness for Christ. In fact, his life, his testimony are only doing damage and cutting the heart of Christ beyond imagination. Therefore, God has no choice but to take him on home to be with him. Thirdly, the third lesson in verse three, the strong minister does not deceive people. That means there's no deception about him at all. No deception about the minister, right? The first point I want to make is this. Paul did not deceive people by preaching a false gospel. Paul was not out to secure a personal following. Paul was not all out to earn a living. Paul was uh, not out to serve in a respectable profession. Paul was not out to live a comfortable life. Paul was sincere. Paul was genuine. He preached a true gospel. And he was out only to share that gospel so that men may come to know the only one and true and living God. Secondly, Paul did not deceive the people by the life he lived. He did not preach one thing and live another. He was not unclean. He was not immoral. He was not dirty. He lived a pure and righteous life before God and the people. You know, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, the word of God says, If thou put the brethren in, remember of, in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Hallelujah. Let's go on. Verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. The strong and true minister preaches and ministers to please God, not men. Most men do not want to hear about sin and judgment. Most men do not want to hear about the utter necessity of men to depend upon the death of Christ in order to be saved. Most men do not want to hear about the demand that a person commit all he is and all he has to Christ in order to meet the needs of a desperate world. You know, over the years I've been saying it and I want to say it again today. The preaching of the truth is always not popular. Not with a carnal and unbelieving people. That's right. 
Therefore, when a minister is thrown in the midst of a people who are worldly, he can be tempted to tone down his message to please the people. And the temptation can be especially strong if his livelihood is at risk. However, I want you to note what Paul says. He sought only to please God, not men. There are two reasons why Paul says this. Firstly, it's because God was the person who had trusted Paul with the gospel, not men. God is the one that has entrusted us with the gospel. No one else, not That's men. Right. That's right. God owned the gospel, and he was the person who had called Paul to proclaim the gospel. That's right. Men had nothing to do with the formulation of the gospel, nor with the calling of Paul. And I want to make that clear today. Men had nothing to do with the formulation of the gospel, nor with the calling of us as the ministers of God. That's right. God has taken care, will take care, and continue to take care of us as we preach the gospel. That's right. God has called, this is what Paul says, God has called him to preach, therefore he was God, he was God's. He was God's property. And consequently, he could trust God to take care of him if men reacted against the gospel and attacked him. Secondly is this, God alone will try his heart and judge him. God alone. He was to stand and give an account of his ministry someday when he was to stand before God, not before men. We have to stand as ministers of God. We have to stand and give an account of our ministry one day when we stand before God. Not before men. Men might be able to cause some difficulty for, for the minister on earth, but God would cause difficulty for him through all eternity if he abused or opposed the gospel of God. John 8 verse 29, this is what Jesus says in John chapter 8 verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. The father had not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Jesus said the same thing. I will only do those things, or I always do the things that please the father. I hope you remember these things. As a Christian, as a believer, let's not even talk about being a minister. Your job is to please the Father. Right. 1 Thessalonians chapter, five, uh, chapter 2 verse 5. I'm going back to our main scripture. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 5. For neither at any time used we flattering words as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. The strong and true minister does not preach and minister for what he can get out of it. You want me to come and preach in a seminar? What can I get out of it? Are you going to have live TV? Are you going to pay me a, a, a good love offering? No. The strong and true minister does not preach and minister for what he can get out of it. There are a few points I want you to note. Firstly, the word flattery always means the kind of flattery that is given in order to get something out of people. Paul did not natter people in order to secure their friendship. He did not try to convince people to get their following or support. Of course, he commended people. His letters in the New Testament show he commended people quite often. He commended the churches. But he did it truthfully always covering the weak areas that people needed to strengthen as well as their strong and commendable areas. You know, in, in Job chapter 32, verse 21, Job chapter 32, verse 21, the word of God says, let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto men. Secondly, the word covetousness. It shows that Paul was accused of being in the ministry out of greed. That he had chosen the ministry to earn a livelihood to make money. 
Paul denies this. He says his lifestyle proves it. He declares that the church knows the fact that, that God is witness to the truth. You know, in Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Luke chapter 12, verse 15, here's what the word of God says. And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For as man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Let me go on. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. Verse 6 says this, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. The strong and true minister does not preach or minister for glory, nor for the prestige and authority of a position. Please note two things. Firstly, Paul says that he did not seek the glory, he did not seek the prestige, he did not seek honor or recognition of the people. He was not out to be recognized as a great preacher. He was not out to be recognized as a good minister. He was not seeking to be recognized as a leader or as a man of position and authority. Remember in Matthew 23, 11, Jesus said, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Secondly, Paul says that he had the right to assert his authority as an apostle of Christ. Being a minister of God, I want to remind you, my dear people, being the minister of God is a great honor and man should respect it and man should appreciate the call on a minister. Amen. But a minister of God must not exalt his authority, for he has been called by God himself, called to serve the sovereign majesty of the universe. He must not be demanding and ordering people around. God has not called a minister to hold a position of honor and authority, but God has called a minister to minister and preach the gospel. Let's go on, verse 7 to 8, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 to 8. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear, ye were dear to, unto us. The strong and true minister preachers and ministers gently and lovingly. What Paul says is descriptive as it shows the deep love he held for the church and its believers in Thessalonica. Firstly, we say that Paul was as gentle towards the Thessalonican church as a mother who nurses her children. The idea is that the minister must minister to his people with tenderness, with care, with warmth, with intensity, affection, and love. The minister must treat his people as precious, his most beloved people, holding them ever so closely to his heart. Paul's affection for his people was so strong that he preached the gospel to them in the midst of adversity and great opposition. And Paul was even willing to do even more. He was willing to pour out his soul for them. He was willing to sacrifice his very life to make sure that they came to know Christ and the eternal salvation that was in Christ. Note that Paul says he was willing to sacrifice his life for one simple reason. They were dear to him. The word, means, the word dear there means beloved. They were his beloved people. Just as you are my beloved people. You are our beloved people. Amen. You know, Paul loved his people. You cannot be a minister of God if you don't love your sheep. You know, in Philippians 4.1, Paul again says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Amen. He loved these people. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we will not be chargeable unto any of you. We preach unto you the gospel of God. The strong and true minister preaches and ministers laboring night and day. Night and day. Paul did not have a five-day week work or a 40-hour week. He did not work until four or five o'clock or until dark and then have the rest for the, the, of the day for himself. Remember, Paul was a servant of Christ. He was a servant to meet the desperate needs of the world. He had to reach men with the glorious news that Christ could save them from death and give them eternal life. So how could he rest and relax when people in every city and community were dying every day? So he, of course, needed sleep and rest as all men do. But it is clear from Paul's letters that he slept and rested only as he needed. He was not slothful. He was not lazy when it came to sleeping and lodging around. I want you to note why. He did not want to be chargeable to any man. What, he did, what, what did he mean? Paul meant just what God says. That every minister and believer has the blood of the world upon their hands and will be held accountable for getting a message out to the people. The message that they can be saved from death and receive eternal life. Let's go on. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy, holily and justly and unblameably we have beha we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Amen. The true and strong minister preaches and ministers with a clean life, an impeccable life. Paul says that he lived a holy life before God. A holy life there means a life separated from the world, a life set apart totally to God. He says that he lived a just and righteous life before men, a life that loved and treated men just as God said and just as he, as God wanted them to, uh, or just as how Paul wanted the people to treat him. He treated them that way. And he lived an unblameable life before both God and men. Verse 11 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. The strong and true minister preached as a father, tenderly giving direction. Earlier we spoke about mother, about a minister being like a mother. Now I'm telling you a minister being like a father, right? So the, the, the minister is not only like a mother, but he's also like a father. And we see three fatherly functions that are listed in verse 11. Firstly, the minister exhorts just like a father. That means the minister will direct you, the minister will guide you, the minister will teach you. Secondly, the minister comforts just like a father. That means the minister will encourage you, the minister will console you, the minister will, will support, sustain, hold up, lift up, relieve, and ease your pain. Thirdly, the minister charges just like a father. That means he testifies. The minister will witness. The minister will protect. The minister will warn. The minister will discipline also. That's right. Because he's a father. Yes. I hope you understand. Because if you see these qualities in a minister, then you know he's a minister of God. Amen. If you don't see this and you only hear flowery words, then you better check scripture and seek the Holy Spirit. Amen. I've given you all the qualities of a minister of the kingdom of God. Let's look at the last point that I want to make. Verse 12 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
that ye will walk worthy of God who had called you unto his kingdom and glory. The strong and true minister will preach and minister with one objective. There's only one objective, to lead his people to walk worthy of the Lord. God has given us the most glorious promise imaginable. God's promise of the wonderful privilege, this wonderful privilege of living forever in his kingdom and glory. Therefore, you and I must continue to walk worthy of that promise. Yes, right. No matter the situation, no matter the pandemic, no matter the, 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 the environment that we are in, we must walk worthy of that one promise, that glorious promise, the privilege of, of, of living forever in the kingdom of God. We must live excellent lives. Some of us think the end of the world is coming so we can relax and be at home. That's laziness and that's not of the kingdom. We must excel wherever God has put us. Amen. If you're supposed to be at home, excel at home. Don't be slothful and lazy. Walk day by day just as we should walk. Yes. In everything we do, when we excel, then we honor and we build up the name of God. Amen. But when we are slothful and lazy, we only honor ourselves. I want to encourage you this morning. Even as, as our church and ministry has gone into a time of 40 days fast and praying, today is the second day. I want to, to, to remind you and encourage you this morning that even as, as we progress and journey through this season, that we will live an excellent life in these 40 days and beyond, not just for the 40 days. That we will Keep on honoring our God and building the name of God. You know, in Galatians 5, 16, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul says, then, This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. Walk in the spirit. Be aware of the presence of God in our lives. Obviously, we are not floating in some cloud. Some of us think that when I say walk in the spirit, you think you're floating in some cloud and you are being separated from the earth. The time will come when you will stand on clouds. But now is not the time. That's right. But walk in the spirit. Be aware of the presence of God and discern what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for appointing ministers, including us, every believer. We thank you, Lord, for your promises, your promises, your glorious promise of living with you forever. Father, we pray, just like Paul, that you'll strengthen us in this season. In our journey, you'll reveal more to us that we will be more than overcomers. We will be more than conquerors because we are in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Mara, I just want to say something. I just want to bring an exhortation to each and every one of you. Now, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter 23, verse 7, As a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh, so is he. I think everything that Dr. Chris has preached this morning, Pastor Chris has preached this morning, speaks about basically as how do we think about ourselves. And that is why Solomon said, as a man thinketh, so is he. How do you think of yourself as a Christian? Right? Because how you think causes you to behave in a particular way as a Christian. How you think leads on to your behavior. 
So your be your thinking and your behavior is connected. We can never divide our thinking and our behavior from each other. That's why the Bible says they are the keys to life for those who find them. They bring health to the whole body. Be careful what you think because your thoughts run your life. Your thoughts run your life. Don't use your mouth to tell lies. Don't ever say things that are not true. Keep your eyes focused on what is right and look straight ahead to what is good. Be careful what you do and always do what is right. Don't turn off from the road of goodness and keep away from evil paths. That is from the book of Proverbs also. So today, as we have gone into a time of fasting and prayer, it is very imperative and important for every believer during this time to keep our hearts focused on the ways of the Lord. We can never bring change to any environment that we are in if we do not operate through those keys which lead to life and godliness. We cannot bring any change. There's darkness around us, but we should be the light. The light as how we live, how we serve God's kingdom. God has given to us a great opportunity. Let's not miss our opportunities in this day and time. No matter what we have, everything comes from God. Within us and everything that God has given to us is from the Father of lights, the Heavenly Father. Let us never forget all these things. That we are here given an opportunity to love God as well as to serve our wonderful God. Amen. Okay, to our friends on social media, we thank you for joining us. Those on Zoom, please hold on. Uh, to those on social media, we'll see you all next week. Yes. God bless you. God bless you.